Ben, look, we've got so many questions uh, rolling in for you. Uh, lots and lots and lots of people saying that they very, very upset uh, that you're no longer the Reform UK uh, Deputy Leader. But I know, I know you've heard a lot about that. But, but one uh, specifically from Fabian Mitchell asks, why didn't Nigel Farage speak to you about his plans to change the structure of the party? Does Nigel not realise that he will need someone who is a strategist for reform? So, I mean, um, Nigel has appointed the team that he wishes to strategize with. Um, you know, I may yet be part of that team. I know that Nigel does want to build branch networks and he wants to, in his own words, professionalize the party. And he's getting on with that with, um, you know, the senior man, the senior leadership that he's now got. Um, but of course, I'm always at Nigel's disposal. And um, if he wishes to have my input, you know, he knows he knows well where I am. So, um, I mean, I'm just kind of watching now and I, I'm not part of the leadership. I'm just watching to see what they do. I, I do think it's very important that they do have branches, that they do professionalize, that we take advantage of the extra money that's come that's going to be coming in and has come into the Reform UK party, that we build data. We understand where the vote is. I mean, it's hilarious. You know, one of our MPs was a paper candidate. We didn't realize how strong the vote in Thurrock would be for Reform UK. Now we need to blooming well understand that before we get to 2029. You know, we need to get all that kind of stuff together. And all of that is going to take money. It's going to take expertise, human resource, and so on. And I'm obviously at the disposal of the party to in, help in that endeavor in, you know, in, in any way I can. Cutler asks, do you think Farage is playing the long game and will eventually dissolve reform and become Tory leader? And I know this is a bone of contention with a lot of Reform UK supporters because Nigel did say before the election, but before he was actively back as leader of the party, that he did think he would end up being Conservative leader. Well, I, I can't see any route into the Conservative Party actually merging with us or taking us on with any great heart because they're infected. The Conservative Party, I know, Dan, that you may not entirely agree with me, but I think they're an infected party. They've got some fantastic people, Suella Braverman, Priti Patel, Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, Andrea Jenkins, you know, some really super people in the party. Andrea, sadly, and Jacob lost their seats, but um, they've got the whole One Nation lot, and they're the they're the lot who don't really care about the nation state of the United Kingdom. They're completely open to unfettered immigration, uh, whether that's skilled, unskilled, whatever. They would never stop the boats. They want to stay in the European Court of Human Rights. They, they're kind of Blairites, basically. And they're the problem. So unless the Conservative Party can get rid of their Blairite section, I can't see how they could really ever merge with Reform UK. And... You know, obviously people like Suella would be most welcome to join, I'm sure, if she wished to join. But we are on the march. This is what I said repeatedly before the election and, and during. And, and I'll say it again. You know, we are on the march. The political wind is in the sails of reform. And reform doesn't need to merge with the Conservative Party. It will replace the Conservative Party. It absolutely will. No doubt. Reform UK will replace the Conservative Party. Do you know what, Ben? Uh, I wouldn't have agreed with that a year ago, but I have changed my mind to a certain extent. I look at the Conservative Party now and I see the way that the wets are so yeah. out of touch that they should be in the Liberal so Democrats and they do not take the lessons ever. They do not take the lessons from Brexit. Yeah. They do not take the lessons from Boris Johnson taking on the Red Wall. They do not take the lessons from this absolute thumping at the most recent election. So I am losing faith. But I guess what I would argue, Ben, is that what's over is a broad church conservative party. That is over. Yeah. I do think the right needs to be united in some way. So I do wonder if there has to be some sort of alliance between those good folk in the Conservative Party you mentioned, the Suellas, the Pretties, uh, the Jacobs, the Andrea Jenkins, and Reform UK, because, as you say, it's a huge uphill climb for Reform UK to do this. 
uh, without I any don't think it's the, the you know, reasons. actually, Dan, I don't think it's such a big uphill climb. When you get a paper candidate returned as an MP, yes. you know, the yes, electorate yes. is crying out. The electorate is, I, I don't know if you fish, but sometimes the, the, the river, if you're fishing in a river, is alive with fish. Sometimes it's dead. And you can chuck your fly into the river when it's alive with fish. And no matter how awful a fisherman you are, you come out with a massive number of fish. And at the moment, that's where we are. You know, Reform UK is fishing uh, in a river which is stuffed full of people who want to vote reform. And I, I, I know that Richard and Nigel really want proportional representation. I've got some question marks over PR. But actually, ref reform is going to win under first past the post. We're not going to have to change the electoral system. We are going to win under first past the post. And that will be a much sweeter victory because we would have defeated the entitlement of the two-party system and we would have done it under their rules and we will then be able to form a really strong government. I would love Suella, etc., to join reform. Of course, why wouldn't I? You know, they're perfectly, they're, they're reform, they're reformers like, like we are. So, they, you know, they should, they should cross the floor. But can I just say one more thing about the Conservative Party? It's Please. not really my party, but, you know, the reason I think they've lost touch with the electorate is because they used to have two or three, four million members, I think, at their peak, which was back in, you know, uh, sort of pre-war, uh, immediately after the war period. And that was a massive proportion of the electorate. So their own membership would inform them about what was going on in the electorate. So they were in touch with the electorate. And similarly, Labour Party were in touch with the electorate through the massive union backing and support and membership that it had. Both parties have lost touch with the electorate. The Labour Party's turned it back on the unions. It's in bed with big business. And the Conservative Party effectively has, to, has lost its membership. It's down to 150,000 now. And that's why I think it's also crucial, by the way, that reform does democratise. Because we, we are in the vein of the British people. But we better make sure we stay there, that we've got a very large, broad membership that can feed ideas up to the leadership so that we stay relevant. So we know what it is that the British people want. So we don't suffer the same fate that these other two parties have suffered. On the whole issue of electoral reform, uh, June Moultrie has a question for you, Ben. She says, I'd like to, to ask Ben to explain his reservations with changing the voting system. She says, first past the post is dreadful. Look at the number of seats the Lib Dems have now. However... France has PR and they managed to con the voters out of what they wanted too. I mean, I guess, Ben, you'd say France's system is definitely designed to try and stop a Le Pen-like movement. But what is it that makes you think that first past the post should potentially stay when you have that absolute inconsistency and complete unfairness when it comes to the Lib Dems receiving fewer votes and so many more seats? So the Lib Dems have done something that we are now in the process at reform of doing, which is to really understand the data. You remember I talked about data, understanding where our vote is. They know precisely where their vote is and they divert all their resources to winning those seats. And they've done it exceptionally well. So three and a half million votes has turned into 72 seats for them. 4.1 million votes has turned into five seats for us. But if we do what I'm advocating, democratize and really understand, get in touch with the people, understand where our vote is, we will be able to turn 4.1 million votes into six or seven million votes, first of all, number one. And number two, we will know precisely where we, we, we should be making our efforts. Again, I give you the example of a paper candidate winning in Thurrock. I mean, you know, that is just a fluke. And it's a fluke that evidences that we're not in touch with our base because we should have had I mean, I'm not in any way decrying James McMurdo. He's a perfectly reasonable human being, I'm sure, and, a, and will make a good MP. I, I don't know him. But, um, you know, you would have thought we put a high profile sort of leadership kind of candidate in Thorough. We didn't. It's because we didn't know where the vote is. But we will learn the system and we will learn it fast and we will make sure we get it. The other concern I have about PR is that inevitably to form a government, you end up uh, having to do a coalition and having to do a deal and giving up your principles. 
So when people vote for Reform UK, they vote for a whole load of policies. If we have to do a deal with the Lib Dems to become a government, can you imagine how awful that would be? Because all our voters would be looking at us, giving up on key policy points. And we saw this with, I'm, I'm not making an argument in favour or otherwise about Geert Wilders, but in order to get into government, Geert Wilders, who is the champion of the, of the right wing, if you like, for, you know, in the Netherlands, has had to give up on really crucial points that he used to stand utterly firm on. Maloney, who got elected on a ticket to stop the boats, has been neutered by her inability to really give effect to her policies because of the need to you know, keep the broader church happy. So first past the post is a bloody awful system if you're outside, outside it. But if you can learn it, champion it, work through it, understand where the vote is, make sure that vote comes out for you. Actually, we can make it work for Reform UK. Yeah, and actually, I really do think there is the chance because it's not just uh, the paper candidate that won. It is the fact that in these Labour seats, on an election day where all of the momentum seemed to be heading to Labour, in fact, there were so many swings from Labour to Reform UK that actually those seats in five years' time, when they see the socialist hellscape yeah. that has been unleashed by Slippery Starmer, will certainly go to Reform UK. I mean, it was close, as you say, with paper that candidates. And there were nearly 100 seats where Reform UK was in second place. So, I know. That's huge. That's yeah. huge. Think about that. Second and place the in 100 wall. seats. All the red wall. And believe me, Ben, the, the Tories aren't going to win back the red wall with Tom no. Tugendhat or Victoria Atkins. They're dreaming. But we will win the red wall because we will reduce, we will want to reduce immigration and they will see the damage that cheap imported labor has done to their, yes. to their communities. So they will come to us and we will beat labor. And if we come first in those 98 seats, you'd now be looking at the official opposition, a member of the official opposition. And I yeah. would be in parliament. I might Absolutely. even still be deputy leader. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. You certainly would be, I, I'm sure. Uh, and I think it's really interesting. You look at the example of Lee Anderson, don't you? Lee Anderson would have lost if he had remained in the Conservative Party. And of course, he was suspended. Yeah. One of the most stupid moves made by Sunak because he walked it as a Reform UK MP. And I wish some of my friends like Andrea Jenkins had had the resolve to say, you know what, I can see where this is heading. I do think there was one issue, though. Nigel obviously threw his hat into the ring so late that did make a bit of a difference in terms of uh, some of those potential Tory defectors being a little bit too afraid to do it. Now, on that note, very simple question, but I think it's an important question to ask, Ben, uh, from Tracy Bryce, who simply says, in five words, is Nigel to be trusted? Oh, so it's, I, I turned the question on its head, and I wouldn't say whether or not it's Nigel that needs to be trusted. We need to have a party system that ensures that it is the collective will of the party that is represented through its leadership. And that's another reason why I, I want to democratize, why I've been banging the drum. And it may seem to people that I've suddenly come out for democratization. This is a debate that goes back a long time. Um, I've been, I had this debate with Richard before I agreed to join reform. It was a crucial issue for me. In the end, they didn't democratize, but I got a letter of comfort from Richard. And so it's not about whether or not we can trust Nigel. No human being should be vested with so much authority and power that we are all looking and hoping and praying that they stay true. What we need is a body, a collective, which has a set of rules that governs it in a manner to ensure that we can trust the leadership because the leadership generally represents the people in the party. I think Nigel, by the way, is the best leader we could have. It's got nothing to do with that, um, whether we can trust him or not. It's 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 it, it, it's just having the right mechanisms and processes in place. And, and that's the growing pains, if you like, the growth pains of going from being an insurgent, nascent insurgent party to being one that actually wants to govern. And it's, you know, we need to make that. That's why I'm making this case now. Do it now, because we've got five years and five years may seem like a long time. If we don't do it now, we ain't going to do it. And we do not want to be reinventing the party in 2028 
with 12 months to go for a general election. It would be daft as brushes. Totally. We and also, do it now. Yeah. who knows what will happen? Who knows if, if Labour will go the distance? Because remember, there is also the potential. Yeah. I, mean, I know they've got a massive majority, but there is the potential for a, a, a massive clash between Starmer and the left of his party at some point. The cracks are already showing. But look, Anna Island asks Ben, what are your opinions on Trump and the attempted assassination? Oh, obviously, wretched that, you know, Donald Trump wasn't able to campaign without complete security for his physical being. And um, uh, I think that's got to stop. Somehow Trump should have been, he should have had better security. I don't buy the argument, by the way, that we're in a much more divisive society now than we were before. I think that, you know, we see division much more on Twitter and social media because it's all there. But it's not the first time someone's taken a pop at the president of the United States of America or, uh, you know, a, a candidate. It's kind of does happen. But it's awful that it did happen to Trump. I think, par not paradoxically, I think the result of this is going to be that Trump's going to walk the election. You know, that's what's going to happen. And, um, you know, so from a from a Republican, from a, a nationist's perspective, because I'm a nationist, I think that's terrific. I think Biden's a danger to... The, you know, the entire globe. And what do you make of the specific events of the day of the assassination? Because there were these massive security failings. He came one millimetre away from death. Do you buy into, and I hate using this term because, as you know full well, because you were campaigning alongside folk like me, over uh, much of the COVID pandemic, things that were described as conspiracy theories ended up becoming true. But I had a security expert on my show yesterday who said none of this makes sense. It, it's got to have been some sort of inside job. Do, do you do you have any thoughts al you know, along along those lines? Yeah, I mean, it, it is very odd, isn't it, that members of the crowd were pointing at the gunner and saying, look, there's a guy up there with For a rifle. two minutes. For two minutes before the security guards did anything. It's very peculiar that high van vantage points, which would be a natural place to take a pop at someone, weren't already checked out and weren't under surveillance. I mean, the whole thing was an absolute catastrophe from a security perspective. And that then raises naturally the question about, well, how did that come to be? Are they just a bunch of incompetent idiots or was this contrived? And, you know, that the jury is out on that. But um, I mean, my goodness, can you imagine a bullet clipping your ear? And I have to say, if it had been me, I wouldn't have emerged from under the podium, something in the air saying, fight, fight, fight. I would have stayed under the podium. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it was an extraordinary moment that I think did show the true character of Trump. I always believed that that character was there, but I think it's very difficult for his opponents who try and paint him as something that he's not to deal with that now. Um, and look, fi final question, Ben. Mary asks, why is it in the UK that you can mock and ridicule any religion, especially Christianity, but you can't mock and ridicule Islam. Well, I think it goes back to the protected characteristics that I was referring to in the first half of the programme, where um, it is the cultures and the belief systems and values of people who've come to this country that are protected under our regulatory and legal framework. And it is our own culture and our own values and our own beliefs and so on that are trampled on. And it works not just culturally, but it also works economically. And, uh, you know, it's a disaster. We've got to get rid of DEI. We've got to go back to the very basic um, uh, basic um, argument, which was made by Martin Luther King, that it's not the color of your skin that matters, but the content of your character. And that everyone is, when I was growing up, as I said, I, my dad was Punjabi, my dad's Punjabi, my mom's English, um, uh, 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 ethnically. and. When I was growing up, everyone was equal. I was told everyone's equal. It doesn't matter what color you are, everyone's equal. So how, why are we affording protective characteristics to people, embedding prejudice, embedding differences, judging people based on, the, on their skin color? That is, that is racism. That is racism. DEI is at its heart prejudiced. I call it reverse racism, but that's racism. And we've got to stop it. 
And so Islam has got this protected characteristic, whereas Christianity, it's open day on Christianity. Well, I hope maybe that there are some people listening, Ben. I mean, it's literally been reported this afternoon that Microsoft has laid off its internal DEI team, which seems to be a really significant move if they're following in the footsteps of uh, Elon Musk and X. So I think, uh, look, you're absolutely right to call it out. want to share some of our viewer comments with you, uh, Ben, because they've been coming in thick and fast. SJ says, Ben oozes class. Don't think I've ever seen him put a foot wrong. Man of integrity. Uh, Phil writes, I hope Ben holds the line and stays with Reform UK. He is much needed by the people and Reform UK too. Uh, uh, then we have Fran- uh, Francine who- Taylor who says, I'm very annoyed Ben Habib is no longer part of Reform. I only voted for them because Ben Habib was part of it. But the good news is, Ben, you've obviously clarified today that you are still a part of Reform UK. Uh, Richard B says, keep it going, Ben. Don't let them get you down. I'm going to have to see Farage is prepared to speak out about Islam before I can support reform now. And Jack says, Ben is smart, erudite, and stands up for British values and culture. And finally, from Hayley Howard, love Ben and so pleased he's staying in Reform UK. Ben's right, the British public deserve adult leadership. We definitely need to get the children out of Westminster and let the adults take over. So look, it's going to be a very exciting five years. I know that you're going to be such a huge voice. And that's why I wanted to speak to you in depth today, because I also believe we haven't spoken about the media, Ben, but I also believe that it's utterly critical that there is an independent media revolution in the UK too. And I hope that can go hand to hand with the development of Reform UK because we've seen that happen in the US. Well, you're doing it, Dan. You're doing it. All credit to you. You're doing it. Thank you. Well, well, I mean, obviously, it was a situation that was thrust upon me (laughs) because I was very committed to GB News until what happened last year. But I feel like the timing is perfect because the way that people are consuming their news is changing. There's no longer a trust in the mainstream media. And I I really hope that the the two things grow, that the rise in the independent media and, and the rise in Reform UK. And look, you know, I had supported the Conservative Party under... Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, but I've been very open about the fact that I voted for Reform UK at the election, and I was proud to do so. The Conservatives have not been Conservative for the past two years. I thought the defenestration of Boris, and by the way, I'm not saying Boris is perfect. I was very critical with him over Nut Zero. I was very critical with him over lockdowns. And then the second defenestration of Liz Truss as she tried to pursue true conservative policies really were the final straw for me so look it's a very exciting time and where i am with you is that i do believe that reform uk can win in 2029 but as you say there's a lot of work to be done before then thank you so much for watching dan Wooten outspoken please do subscribe if you want lots more clips and interviews like that plus if you want to watch our totally uncensored after show then visit www dot outspoken dot live